So we are going to start in, oh, here we go. You're going to start in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, verse 14. Matthew 25, verse 14. Here we go. Jesus says this. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven, of which Jesus is king, and his kingdom is everyone, everywhere, for all time, past, present, future. Jesus is king. He's Lord. He proved it when he came back from the dead. So the kingdom of heaven, and we are royal subjects of that kingdom. Not just that. I mean, we're not just um, on 6th Street in the kingdom somewhere, you know, off in a and a little cul-de-sac. We are sons and daughters with full access to every single place in the kingdom. It's phenomenal. Um, kingdom of heaven, it says, verse 14, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, um, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I've made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, now this is where it gets, this is where it gets tricky. He says, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. And you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, um, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents, which is crazy. Like give to the one who has a bunch even more. He's being nuts right now. For to everyone who has will, be, will more be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast this worthless pain in my butt into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. So what does this have to do with the inspiration of Jesus has risen from the dead? What, what on earth is Gerald getting into here? This, this sounds pretty crazy, especially the ending was very depressing, wasn't it? Um, but I, I think when you read this, uh, when you read this passage, I want you to picture someone who was given, when we hear talents, we don't even know what that means. Someone is given, um, $10,000 and another person is given $50,000 and another person is given a million dollars. Okay. The, the person who's given a million dollars goes out and comes back and says, I came up with $2 million. I went crazy. I hit up Vegas. 
I gambled a bunch of it. I made double the profits. Not only that, I, I put some of the money into investments. I started a couple side businesses. We um, did really well. Here are the earnings. Second guy comes back. All right, I went crazy. I tried this, I tried that. Um, actually, I, I was able to double my profits as well. Now the third person goes, um, I was afraid that I was gonna fail. I was afraid that you would be mad at me. I was afraid that, that if I went off with your money and I didn't succeed, that you would be ticked, that you would punish me, that, that you would you know, somehow flunk me or whatever. And the response that Jesus gives is essentially, you, you don't even know me. How dare, like, how could you think of me like that? And I want you to go back to what we talked about with Jesus on the cross, who says, there's no condemnation. Father, forgive them. Their guilt is absolved. They're free. They're loved. They're forgiven. They have grace. And then to have someone turn around and go, I'm afraid that you're going to judge me. I'm afraid you're going to condemn me. I was afraid to take a step. I was afraid to take a move. I was afraid to do anything. And Jesus is going, do you even know me? Do, do you even remember the cross? You forget the type of loving God that I am? Why were you afraid that I had come to condemn you? I didn't come to condemn you, but to save you. Perfect love, cast out fear. It's like you don't even know me. It's like you don't even know me. The fact that you're so afraid and nervous and unwilling to take a step for me means that you don't understand what my love is like. The only thing that, that ticks me off is the fact that you misunderstand me, that you don't understand my love, that you won't receive my perfect acceptance. The only bookkeeper here is the servant who decided that he had to fear this non-existent audit. But he thought somehow God was gonna keep score and God was gonna nail him to the wall and God was gonna punish him if he didn't come up with the right profits. God saying, all I want you to do is live free. I love you. I've forgiven you. I accept you. You didn't have to do a freaking thing. And yet we all walk around with this fear of God instead of the perfect love that casts out fear. Jesus said, I am love. I have come to show you what I'm like. I die on the cross for my enemies. I call everyone to myself. And when we walk around in fear, instead of living courageously in the grace of God, this is what this parable is about. It's about Jesus who looks at someone and says, if you're afraid to take a step, to make a move, to live radically for me and for my kingdom, it's like you don't even know me. It's like you don't even know what I'm like. You could do anything you want. You can fail as miserably as you want. It won't be fun when you fail, but you're going to be secure in my love. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. The idea that we're going to somehow go out there and fail and God's going to write us off or cast us out or quit loving us or no longer approve of us, you were never approved because of your performance and you'll never be lost because of your lack of performance. You're secure, right, loved, holy, good, clothed in the royal robes of God while you are sinners. Christ died for you. And because of that, because you're secure, loved, free in the love of God, you can live radically free, take risk, run out with your five talents and go crazy with it. Try things, start things, attempt things. If you come back and you lost it all, God's gonna go, well done good and faithful servant because you believed that I was good, that I love you, that I accept you, that I approve of you, that I've called you, that I've sent you. You no longer have to live with shaky knees and fear and nervousness that I'm somehow gonna, gonna get rid of you. It's like parents that wanna see their kids just, just go up and have fun and play the game. And the kid's up there like so afraid to strike out that he won't swing the bat. You're going, swing the freaking bat. I don't care if you strike out. Swing the bat. Go, have fun, play the game, enjoy yourself. I've already got you covered. You're already loved. If you strike out every time you're secure in me, what I don't want to see is you up there not enjoying it. 
not loving me, not using your gifts, not using your talents, not running out with all of your might. You're robbing yourself and you don't understand me or my love if you live like that. It's almost like be hot or cold. This apathy, this fear of taking a step, of making a move, of trying something, of using your gifts. Like I, I just, you know, I just want to vomit that. Like have some fire. Use those gifts. If you're going to fail, make it glorious. <laughs> make it a huge crash. But you know what I don't want to see? I don't want to see you standing in the batter's box forever, doing nothing, not taking a step, because you misunderstand the security that you have in me, the love that you have in me, the freedom that you have in me. You could have earned a million dollars or two cents. You could have blown it on horses for all I care. At least that way, you would have been a gambler after my own heart. But when you come in here and insult me, Mr. Risk himself, it shows that you just don't understand me. And he says, Capon says this at the end of this parable, he says, um, it's, it's as if Jesus looks at the man and says, listen here, you little creep. If you can't live with my kind of acceptance, which is that I can accept absolutely everything except distrust of my acceptance, then you can get the hell out of here. Boys, show Arthur the door. <laughs> and it's God saying, you're free, you're loved. Now go, swing, attempt, use your gifts, try, be bold, be courageous. And so because of that, I, I, wanna, um, I wanna use someone, I'm gonna use Paul. So Paul who encountered Jesus, he crucified followers of Jesus or, or had them killed, uh, had them killed, stoned, whatever, because they followed Jesus. He, he came across Jesus, he, he met Jesus on the road. And when that happened, he gave his whole life to following Jesus. Now here's the thing, Paul calls himself chief of sinners. Now, I don't think that Paul was, was being like falsely humble. I'm the chief of sinners, but in reality, I'm like super good, right? I, th I think in reality, Paul understood that he was a wreck. He was a train wreck. He was broken. He was a sinner. He had a past. He had literal skeletons buried somewhere over the Judean countryside, right? So you've got a guy with some serious baggage and sin and failure and mistakes. And he doesn't say, I used to be the chief of sinners. He says, I am the chief of sinners. So you've got someone who is a failure, a sinner, a screw up. And yet, what does he do? Does he walk around in fear that God won't accept him? Does he, is he so cautious that he just stays in one spot and says, I'm gonna do my best to not sin for the rest of my life and then die and hope that I will be accepted? No, he travels all over land and sea and he starts churches and he reaches people and he reaches out to outcasts and he develops leaders and he sends people out and he gets on boats and he travels across land and he does all sort of crazy, daring, courageous things. How does the chief of sinner, sinners go out as such an entrepreneur, church planter, missionary, kingdom expander? How does he do that when he, when he knows that he's such a screw up? Because he's got this blanket this blanket of grace, this covering of grace, that he goes, there is no condemnation for me. I'm free, I'm forgiven, I'm loved, I'm secure. There's nothing I can do that would cause God to love me less. So you know what that means? I can go crazy. I can be bold. I can be courageous. I can start churches. I can develop leaders. I can travel here. They could stone me. They could beat me. They could imprison me, but I am no longer afraid. I will go and I'm gonna risk it all. Why? Because he wasn't living in this fear and trepidation. He wasn't constantly looking over his shoulders. He didn't view God as the angry taskmaster that when he came back was going to nail him to the wall and ask him all kinds of questions and interrogate him for how he spent his money. He knew that God was good and he trusted him and he believed. He believed. 
And so he risked it all. He went nuts. He tried things. The second thing is, um, remember after Jesus rose from the dead and he told the disciples, okay, I want you guys to go to a go to this spot. It's a really cool spot. It's on 14th and Vine, right? If you go over there, it's a really sweet spot. There's this room upstairs. It's awesome. Got all these bar top tables and they usually have the croissants sitting out. You go up there, you're, you're going to meet uh, Apollos and, you know, Philip and, you know, Jezebel and all those people, right? You're going to go hang out up there. And when you meet up with all them, a crowd of people meet you. I just want you to wait there because the Holy Spirit is going to fall on you guys. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I just want you to wait. Like, don't go anywhere until I send the Spirit. And then he sends the Spirit. Now, I, I don't know about you, but if you've had experiences where the Spirit of God has spoken to you, has given you, like, clarity or passion or wisdom or love or direction or something, I've had these powerful moments in my life and story where I'm like, God, I really sense that God spoke to me in a really, in a really unique and fascinating way. And oftentimes I fail to hear the voice of the spirit because I have so many darn distractions in my life. Now, if Jesus came back from the dead, and if God sent his spirit, which is God, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, to be with us and to dwell in us and to never leave us or forsake us, you guys actually believe that? It sounds really weird. It's pretty crazy, right? That God would be with you, that he would never leave you or forsake you, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is with you in your Mazda, right? At when, when you're getting your coffee at the grocery store, when you're in your yard, when you're, when you're sitting around your dinner table, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is with you. If you believe that, we should probably listen. We should probably listen because the same enormously powerful and wise and good spirit that empowered the ministry of Jesus is with you. Now, how dumb would it be for us to go out on our own strength, trying to make a difference apart from listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit? It, it's just, it's stupid. It's less effective. You're going to get burned out doing that. And I speak from firsthand knowledge because I ditch the spirit. Oftentimes I leave him in the Mazda, so to speak. He doesn't leave me. He's with me all the time. I just, I fail to listen oftentimes. So I was jogging one day along the road and um, I had these in and I don't know, I probably had rap music on really loud and jogging really well. I don't know how fast you can be the judge if you jog with me. I think I move pretty quick, but I was jogging down the road. I had my, my AirPods on and they were super loud and I, I get a text later that somebody had slowed down next to me, was honking their horn at me, trying to say hi, someone from our church. But here I was out in another world, listening to my song, just jogging. I didn't even see them. I didn't see them. I didn't hear them because my AirPods were so loud. I didn't see them. I didn't hear them. I just kept going. And I think that's symbolic of how we live when the Spirit of God is attempting to speak to us, my sheep hear my voice, but our AirPods are too loud, or we're scrolling on our newsfeed, or we're surrounded by all these regular distractions of life that we, we do not tune in to hear the voice of the Spirit who desires to give us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. The, the one... We, we, let me put it this way. We try to experience peace apart from the spirit of God who gives us peace and our own strength. And Jesus says, come away with me, rest with me. I'm, I'm going to give you that life, that love, that peace that you're looking for. You can't experience that apart from God. Um, 
so the Holy Spirit, I, I think we, we get to be risky and crazy because of God's grace. And the last thing that I'll say is Jesus uses this language. If, if we think about what after Easter, after the resurrection, what does this mean for us? Jesus calls us to be salt and light. Salt and light. Now, I was talking with a friend of mine this past week who, who said they heard someone say in a teaching that you, as followers of Jesus, you can't be too salty. I disagree. Have you ever had a dish that had way too much salt on it? You're just like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. What our kids were trying to dump salt on one of their dishes the other day and the top came off and it just, and you can't like unsalt it. It's everywhere. It's like all in it. And then you're drinking so much because there's just so much salt. And I think the dish already had soy sauce, right? So it was like quadruple salted, ridiculous amount of salt, not good for you, right? The salt, the idea of salt and of light, I mean, Jesus is the light of the world. And you think of the sun and the greater light and the lesser light, the sun, the moon, the stars, all that kind of stuff. We're meant to be little lights, let your light, your, your, your lamp, your lantern shine wherever you go. And, and salt is just seasoning, right? Just a little bit on top. So the concept is like subtlety. The concept is subtlety that you get to sort of lamp a dark room. You don't want to go, how many, how, how bright can we make this sucker, right? Let's just put a hundred lamps in here and we're going to crank the light up super, super bright. Or we're going to get these dishes and we're just going to dump salt all over these things. The concept is a, is a subtlety that as you are going, that's the language, as you're going, make disciples. So the language is along the way, you're just sprinkling a, lo a little bit of salt in. You're showing a little bit of light to people that are in darkness. So the concept is like you're, you're out to eat and your tip's a little better. Or you're hanging out with someone and everyone's talking about themselves, but you're interested in someone else, not just yourself, right? Or everyone is stuck in their own homes, focused on their own lives, and you show hospitality. It's salt, 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 light, just a little bit. You just sprinkle something just a little different. Maybe ask a question that people have never been asked. Are you happy? Uh, what do you live for? Uh, how can I pray for you? Just a little sprinkle, right? Just a sprinkle, just a little bit of light. It's meant to be salt and light in the world. Not to be like overbearing. If you were to die today, can you tell me where you would go, right? Not something like super overbearing and crazy in somebody's face. But the idea is you'd sprinkle a little bit of salt. Right? Where Jesus would ask things like, who do you say that I am, Right? And um, he'd, he'd ask the woman who was at the, at the well, just simple questions that led to deeper questions. And in the same way, that's what we do as, as we go about life. We, we talk and we listen and we, we think if Jesus was here, what would he do? What would he say? Who would he hang out with? How would he make this environment better and richer and more beautiful? So it's salt and light. So be risky. You got grace. Thank God for that. Do not bury your treasure underground. You don't know Jesus if you live with that sort of fear and insecurity. And then, you know, listen to the spirit. We need the spirit. You can't do the work of God without the spirit of God. And salt, salt and light. Sprinkle that stuff, baby. It's beautiful. It's exciting. Um, so that's, that's my call to us today is that we would live as the people of God no longer in fear, but running the race, running the race. And it doesn't even matter if you lose. You lose that race miserably. You could be the last person. The only thing God doesn't want to see is you standing there at the starting line going, I'm afraid to lose. Just go, run. I don't care. Go. And that's, that's our call is, is to run, just to run. Already approved already given the royal robes. So you, you, you don't even have to be afraid of the outcome. You're already victors, already won. So God, we thank you for your, for your grace um, that enables us 
to just be stupid with our lives <laughs> and crazy and uh, to, to, to take risk, to, to be even dangerous for your sake and for the kingdom's sake, to love people, listen to people, to, to, to give away our, our money, to give away our time, to, to care more about the interests of the people around us than our, than our own, to, to, to not be selfish, but to be selfless, um, to, to give up our desires because we, we care about other people's needs or struggles or problems. So God, give us this radical way of life that, that we would not bury our treasures underground, that we would not misunderstand you, that we would not think that you are a hard man who is watching every step and ready to, to judge and attack us. You were the one who was judged for us. You have set us free. You have declared us innocent. You are for us. And if you're for us, who on freaking earth could be against us? Nobody. We're, we're loved and accepted and approved by you. So God, give us that sort of um, uh, fire in our bones this week. We love you. Amen. Well, that's all I got to say about that.